Hi, I'm Katie Miranda. Welcome to the Palestine Solidarity Telesummit. Today I am here with Jennifer Lowenstein and it's a pretty weird story about how we met. Uh, she she purchased a necklace from me online and she's wearing it now. It's it's one of my Palestine necklaces, my my best seller actually. And we didn't know who either of us was and then you found out that I was doing this telesummit, right? And yeah. And through Unmondo Vice, I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And then Jennifer emailed me. We've been corresponding um, on and off during this whole telesummit, and she actually connected me with Muin Rabani, who was um, the guy I interviewed yesterday. So, Jennifer, welcome. Welcome, and thanks for being so nice and agreeing to have me on. <laughs> I'm really glad I met you, actually. Yeah, it, it's actually strange because I think Jennifer and I really look alike and we found out that our grandparents are from the same town, uh, Mariupol, um, on the Black Sea in Ukraine. So maybe maybe we're related. <laughs> we might be related. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Funny. So, um, yeah. How do you like that meeting through Amazon? Yeah. <laughs> How is that for a, I know. a tactic? <laughs> who who meets their customers on Amazon? Anyway, I know. Jennifer, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us um, about your your work? You're an academic, and um, yeah, yeah, um, that's me. Um, my name is Jennifer Lowenstein. I lived um, in Madison, Wisconsin, for 26 years. So good. Most of my activism was based there, and um, I, I've since moved to State College, Pennsylvania. I've been teaching at Penn State, but I was most of my work. I was the associate director for Middle East Studies at the University of Wisconsin um, for about seven years, and teaching uh, the history of the modern Middle East. And I was really involved in the early 2000s with the Madison Rafa Sister City Pro Project. I co-founded it with a group of activists. Um, we thought it would be an excellent way of bringing two communities together. And, you know, so that not only we would get to know another community, but that people in Madison would see that we're not uh, sistering with, you know, a terrorist cell because the outcry against it was so, so vocal, so vicious. The Madison Rafa Sister City Project was a really big deal in Madison. Um, we tried to take it to the city council for approval. Madison is known for its sister cities, has a number of them still, most of them politically um, oriented, Vietnam, Cuba, Nicaragua, East Timor, but we were condemned very, very sharply and strongly by the established Jewish community uh, for being too political and being divisive. We are causing too much division, not only in the city, but within the Jewish community. And um, it was, an, in, in many ways, it was an amazing experience because it really forced the issue of Israel-Palestine, you know, out in the open in, in Wisconsin. Then we started getting um, people from Israel, from Sweden, from the New York Times, from the Washington Post, who were writing about this. So there's actually still an article in the New York Times about it. Um, in England, got a lot of attention. And uh, at one point, when the... When the Sister City finally came up for a vote after a long process of trying to promote it. Um, the mayor basically said, if it passes, I'll veto it. Oh my God. And the director of the Madison Jewish Community Center at the time wrote to him and said it would be an international embarrassment if. Uh, there was a sister city with a Palestinian city uh, in the Gaza Strip. And uh, 
it was just, it was an unreal but very valuable lesson. And I still had a lot of contacts in Rafa. And the people who are in Madison who are part of that group are still part of that group. And, you know, not as much is happening lately, which is too bad. Not with them, but in general, on the, on the activist scene. So it's nice to know they're still there. Mm -hmm. And um, I suggest lots of people do that. I think it's a really good way of getting local communities and grass, grassroots um, activism, you know, in people's face, so to speak. You, know, you have to... You have to confront people with this stuff or it will be ignored. And one of my um, comments about, you know, what can we do as activists? You know, I don't think there's one earth shattering answer. I think the answer is that you attack it from all sides. Um, the journalist Robert Fisk once talked to me about how easy it is to feel hopeless, like what you're doing all day, every day, is not making a difference. And he said, it's, you can't think that way. What you have to do is imagine a stone wall and that you're chipping away at the stone wall. A lot of people are just chip, chip, chipping away. And it seems, you know, like an impossible task. But he says, if you keep doing that, eventually the wall is going to get cracks. And, you know, you, you are making a difference. It's just slow and it has to be unified. It has to be mobilized. Um, unity in activism, I think, is so important. I can't emphasize that enough. Having the divisions among the left does us more harm, I'm convinced, than almost anything. We've got to be united, even with our differences. You know, I think... We ought to be able to put aside the differences and remember that we're working for Palestinians living under horrific conditions um, under the occupation um, in, in Israel, since it's controlled by Israel, but in Palestine, real Palestine. Um, so, yeah, that was one of the things that I did that I recommend for other people. Other things that... I did on campus with also many uh, people who helped was bring um, lectures and films and sometimes art uh, dis uh, displays to show on campus. Um, and I think in many ways we did a lot. And I like to think it was really good. I like to think we did really great stuff. But I think the the most positive thing about that was that we kept Palestine in the public eye. We didn't stop. It was one thing after another, after another, and educational, artistic, political, uh, economic. I mean, back then we boycotted uh, products from the Israeli settlements. Um, or called for it. Nobody wanted, Nobody was supposed to buy or should have bought these products. And so when I hear people talking about what does work, what doesn't work, I think most of it works, but it has to be done in a concerted way, in an organized way, and it has to be all around. It has to be, you know, this group has something to do, this group has something to do, this does, if something doesn't work, it would be anything with violence, obviously, um, anything that's going to be blatantly anti-Semitic is going to backfire, obviously. Of course, yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah. I, um, uh, you know, I've dealt with that subject so many times and it drives me crazy. I don't know if you've heard about the definition of anti-Semitism that has to be accepted by people in, in England. And, you know, basically all you have to do is criticize Israel and you're anti-Semitic. Not that that's so new, but now it's literally being established as, as a, you know, as a principle, there's actually a definition for what is anti-Semitic. And to me, that's really scary. Um, I think it protects Israel. 
It protects it from criticism. It protects it from certain actions. It's definitely a, sort of a wall against the BDS movement uh, and just free speech. You know, you ought to be able to speak your mind about Israel and Palestine. Speaking of free speech, you had a photo exhibition that was supposed to happen in Madison. Can you tell us about that, like the background and how that came about? Yeah, in the winter and part of, in spring and summer of 2002, I lived in the Gaza Strip and I was working for a human rights organization called the Zan Center for Human Rights and I have only good things to say about it. Um, during that time, March, April, the attack on the Janine refugee camp took place. It was a siege and a massacre. And it was pretty much barred from being on the news. Nobody really knew what was happening inside the camp. And the day the Israeli army pulled out, um, I was with a group of journalists who went in. It was like one of the first people into this horribly destroyed place. I mean, 13,000 people displaced. And it just looked like a moonscape. You couldn't believe there were actually homes there, you know, a week before or however long. And I took photographs while I was there all over the place. And probably the most disturbing for me, the most memorable, was when I walked behind the camp hospital and saw medics and nurses loading bodies of dead Palestinians in shrouds onto the back of a pickup truck. They had been buried during the siege to um, protect against the spread of any disease in the camp. And now they had been dug up and were being literally carted out by pickup truck to have a proper burial. Um, to the right of me, I was sitting up kind of on a, a stone ledge looking down at all of this. And to the right of me were bodies that were being brought in and newly killed people, many of them also in shrouds. And I took pictures of these and not without some ethical reservations but I wanted these pictures to get out. And I developed an entire photo exhibit based on the Janine refugee camp. And there was no business or, or place in Madison that would agree to put them up. It was just unacceptable. But we kept, you know, hammering away and trying to find some place. So this progressive uh, coffee shop called The Daily Grind finally let um, us put up this exhibit in the very back of the cafe. And uh, it was vandalized. It got calls. The owner was told, you know, or chastised for having let that happen. But what was interesting is that I gave a presentation in which I also showed some of these photographs um, on a screen. I gave this presentation um, to a group of people in the, who were in Madison in the summer, many of them had come up from places like Florida for a retirees program for classes. And so there were signs all over campus basically saying that I'm going to be giving this talk on Janine. And it just had Jennifer Lowenstein and it just had Janine. And the assumption, of course, is that I'm Jewish because of my last name. And the audience, the, the room was packed. Um, probably with two thirds of the audience being from this older crowd who were there for the summer on this program. When I started showing the pictures, the tenor of the, of the room, the, the atmosphere was clearly getting tense. And I started getting shout, shouted at by people in the audience. And I remember putting up one of the photographs um, from when I was behind the hospital looking literally at dozens of dead bodies in shrouds, yes. Um, and for me, it was just 
such a gut-wrenching experience, but I put up one of these photographs of a man kneeling beside um, probably a friend or a relative in a shroud, weeping. And when I put that up, a woman at the back of the audience yelled, that didn't happen. Wow. And those are the kinds of responses that I would get. And at one point, (laughs) this woman said, Lowenstein, I would never want you for a daughter. (laughs) And a friend of mine sitting next to her said, don't worry, she wouldn't want you for a mother either. (laughs) But, you know, that's funny stuff. I actually did get death threats. um, And... You know, I've reported them, but I don't think death threats are usually carried out. The one that was the most troubling to me was when I opened an email one day and somebody wrote to me and said, I hope your one-year-old daughter gets blown up in a suicide bombing. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I just thought, that's taking this to a to a new level. I know you had a lot of notes um about what you think is working in the movement and what isn't. Do you want to go ahead and talk about that? Well, in a way I did. And I, I've been watching all of these interviews and, um, you know, I don't think any of them are bad. I think everybody has a good point and I think many different things work. In fact, you know, I think this, what, what is, the most unhelpful is just people being too disorganized or not being involved in local groups. That that upsets me. I think there has to be more mobilization, more organization of, of activists. Like more uh, professionality. In a, in maybe words, that, but also local groups, campus groups, community groups, whatever. I mean, this is a big issue. It involves the United States in a, in a major way, obviously. And uh, I think people have to do whatever they can, whether it's writing letters to the editor, organizing lectures, um, bringing in uh, a group of speakers, having a panel debate. I think conferences are good. I think any time there is a crime committed against the Gaza Strip or the West Bank, or for example, when Trump agreed to make Jerusalem uh, declared at the capital of Israel, these things have to be protested. They have to be made visible. And they'll be, if people are out for one or two vigils or demonstrations, it might get some attention, but I think it has to be a kind of sustained form of activism where, you know, one week somebody is writing a letter to the editor or a few people are. Another week, somebody, people are uh, organizing a demonstration in Washington, D.C. All of these things should be happening at the same time. And I wanted to talk about BDS because um, I was, for some reason, I've I've been um, labeled as someone who is anti-BDS and Mm. That really bothers me because um, I I think boycotts are necessary. I think boycotting um, Israeli products from the settlement uh, is a necessary thing for people who are trying to um, fight for Palestinian rights. And I think divesting from companies that are profiting off the occupation, I also think That's a moral obligation for people. What I think some people forget is that because the settlements themselves are illegal under international law, buying the products from those settlements is illegal. In fact, you know, the um, former special rapporteur on uh, Palestine for the United Nations, John Dugard, commented that Technically speaking, people who buy products from the settlement could be prosecuted for buying illegal illegal products. And another really interesting thing is that a lot of tourists who go over to see Israel are taken into settlements in parts of the West Bank, and they're never told that it's not Israel. They they believe they're in Israel. It perpetuates perpetuates this narrative that um, 
this is all part of greater Israel. In one case, there was an eco program where um, a group of tourists in, um, in, a, in, an, in a settlement occupied, obviously, were given the eco job of helping, of rebuilding. And they were going to build buildings and do all of this in uh, an ecologically um, responsible way. And it was presented that way. It was presented as an environmental camp. But what they were effectively doing was building illegal homes and illegal buildings because they were not on Israeli land. Um, that's right. So, um, yeah, I kind of want to remind people that I think not only is boycotting and divesting important, I think if it is, if it is paired with the constant uh, reminder that it's an obligation to boycott it or divest because it's illegal, you know, that you go, if you go into a settlement and you purchase all these souvenirs, they're illegal goods. Um, and of course, the same thing with the profits off of the um, companies who are investing into the settlements. In a, in a manner of speaking, those are illegal profits. Most people don't think about that because obviously nobody's going to prosecute a bunch of tourists in front of the International Criminal Court for buying souvenirs, but theoretical that uh, for buying illegal souvenirs, but theoretically that's what they're doing. On the question of sanctions, I do oppose sanctions. And the reason is because whether it is Iran or Iraq or Israel, sanctions hurt the people first and and hit them the most the hardest and i don't think that's the right way to go about protesting israel i don't think attacking the population um the general population kids you know young people um i don't think that's helpful because i think one of the one thing that many activists forget is that there is a psychology to understanding um, Israel, the PR industry there capitalizes in a major way on victimization, on Holocaust industry, movies, talks, remembrance days, everything. And when the shooting in Pittsburgh happened recently, it was a horrible tragedy. But this was used by the Israeli government. It was a gift to them. See, we're victims. So anytime uh, the state is able to use actions against it as proof that, see, the whole world persecutes us, and that's why we need to be here, and uh, that's why we need our security, and the Palestinians are all part of this, it feeds into that psychology. And what I would like people to do is to think of the consequences of their actions carefully to make sure that what is being highlighted is not Israel's victimization, but Israel's terrorism, Israel's crimes in the territories, focus on how Palestinians are being treated, what their uh, daily lives are like. God knows the Gaza Strip is a gigantic concentration camp, whether people want to say that or not. People call it an open air prison. It is a concentration camp. It is a densely populated area of land completely cut off from Israel, from the sea, from Egypt. And, um, you know, where Palestinians are concentrated and they have they can't leave. For the most part, Palestinians cannot leave unless there's a time when um Egypt and Israel coordinate the Rafah crossing and allow certain numbers of people to leave. But it's unpredictable. It isn't regular. And living in the Gaza Strip is like living day by day, never knowing whether you're going to make it through that day um, as if it's a normal day or something's going to happen, whether you're going to have enough power to keep your food cold whether you can have enough power to have water in your apartment. And the water in Gaza is poisonous. 
We're poisoning. The, the Gazans are being poisoned by their water supply. And this doesn't really get across to people. It does to a lot. I think a lot of activists are, are aware of it. Um, the electricity problem has been uh, a terrible problem for a long time. And I don't want to uh, forget, I don't want to um, excuse the PA here. The PA, the Palestinian Authority, has had a role in that. And what I saw last week was that Qatar was allowed to bring in fuel supplies to Gaza, uh, major uh, amounts of fuel supplies, so that for the first time in a very long time, Gazans have between 9 and 16 hours of electricity per day. Qatar also paid the salaries of, I think, a hundred, you know, hundreds of, of workers who had not been paid for a long time. So in other words, Gaza was sort of given a shot in the arm. And in my view, that's one of the reasons it was attacked on Sunday and Monday, especially Monday night when it was being bombed. Because Israel always has to let the Palestinians know who's boss. You just got something given to you. Your life is going to be made easier. Well, don't forget who's in charge here. We're going to, you know, and the bombing was terrible. It was going on all night, and I got no coverage here in the news. Nothing. I mean, a line. The, the, the headline I saw was 370 rockets fired by Hamas at Israel. And... It's, first of all, it's misleading um, because they're fired mostly to a single place on the land on flat ground. I'm not saying that's a good thing to do. I don't think it is. But that wasn't the news. The yeah. news was, yeah. was what happened again in Gaza. And this is happening over and over and over again. The destruction is on a scale that most of us can't imagine. And it's not destruction just of military b buildings or uh, police stations, it's schools, it's UNRWA, formerly UNRWA's uh, uh, bases, it's, it's the United Nations uh, camps, compounds, um, it's people's houses. And, you know, this has to be hammered into the minds of people in the United States. Um, but before that will even make an, uh, a dent in their understanding, the education has to be there, the constant dialogue, the constant, you know, why didn't the news present this on television when you know, we need to write to these stations, we need to speak out in any, any time, you know, get on the radio, get on television, get on an, an amazing telesummit. Um, <laughs> and um, hope that... You're not just preaching to the choir. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what I'm afraid of. Right. The, I mean, the viewers of this telesummit are the choir. But right. you're, you're saying that people need to be calling their local news stations and saying, look, this is happening. And newspapers. And a lot of times the newspapers and radio shows, ironically, don't know much about the subject themselves. So they'll let you speak on it or they'll... Um, make a time for a speaker that you brought over from Israel. For example, I brought Amira Haas um, to Madison once, and she was able to speak on the radio and to speak at the university and uh, talk to groups of students. Um, so do you think that's I, like an example of what is working in the movement, like when people bring these speakers yeah. and get them on? I do. Not even, to the choir. Yeah, uh, I do, because even though we may not see anything tangible afterwards, the information is gradually getting out there. And I've been in this, um, I've been a Palestinian human rights activist since the early 80s. Since 81 was the first time I was in Gaza. And when I got involved in, in um, student groups or activist groups on campus back in the 80s, there were no Jews usually involved, um, or there were very progressive Jews, and there were some Palestinian or Arab uh, students from campus who would be involved. Within, by the end of the 
tens, but, but the first decade, you get into some of these groups and you find an enormous diversity of people who are now paying attention to Palestine, a group that I would never, you know, <laughs> white frat boys from, you know, Iowa or so, I mean, you know, people from all over are now starting to join some of these um, activist organizations. And uh, in fact, the last group I was in, the majority were white Americans, not Arab, Arabs, Palestinians or Arab Americans. Um, there were a handful of progressive Jews. I think Israel's going to have a heck of a time with its PR um, in the coming years because the younger generation is starting to really question its policies. And that's a change. That change didn't just happen. It, it was in process for a long time. And I, yes, I like to believe, and I do believe that the activism, the pressure by writing, speaking, boycotting, getting things out into the public, I think it does make a difference. So keep just chipping think, away at the wall? Keep chipping away at the wall. Like literally, uh, literally right. and figuratively. <laughs> Seriously. Um, yeah. And, you know, I want to just say one more time, the divisions in groups um, held in active activist groups and the turf wars and some of the, you know, the nasty stuff that goes on inside some of the leftist organizations that hurts us so badly. We lose sight of the fact that we're there advocating for people in Palestine who whose rights are being completely denied and much worse. I mean, it's a form of torture for many, many people for Home dem. It was so illegal. It's illegal. It's immoral. It's criminal. And we forget that's our focus. We forget that we need to focus on American politicians who don't know anything about Palestine because they've been indoctrinated with pro-Israel um, media for or forever. I mean, it's still out there. You, you know, you still don't turn on the news and see pictures from the Gaza Strip of people being, of people's homes being bombed. Right. And that was right. a very significant event just this past week. So, yeah, I, I think making everything we can as public and as open to the public as possible is important. I'm not interested personally in winning over other Jews because I find that there tends to be a polarized view either you're pro-Israel and you're not going to have anything to do with the self-haters or you're progressive and you're sick and tired of these crazy um, right-wing Israel supporters. For me, the target audience should be those who haven't made up, who don't know, who still need to make up their minds, who still need to learn about it. And a lot of that's uh, young people. It's young people, primarily. I mean, there are older people, too, and... But we have to we have to look at, at the youth, um, you know. They're who, like less set in their ways, less um, attached to their well, identity. Well, and there is information. As, you know. Yeah, there is information available now that was not available in the 1990s and the 1980s when I was working in Palestinian solidarity groups. I started the the spark of my activism was in 1982 with the massacre at Sabra Shatila. That's when, you know, almost overnight I said, this is not something I can support. And I built on that. Um, at the time, protesting the Israeli war in Lebanon was anathema. I mean, I was basically screamed out of a room once for saying, well, I don't think this was the right thing to do. I mean, I was very young. I didn't know very much at the time. But now that information is much more available. We have websites like the Electronic Intifada. We have websites like Palestine Chronicle. We have websites that publish um, pro-Palestinian rights articles. And they're easy to come by. They're there. They're out there. Anybody can get that information. And I think those are extremely important. So, yeah, there's not one. I don't think there's one thing that works. I think it's. Let's let's attack it on all sides in a way that is 
moral, so I'm saying, uh, <laughs> not insane, and um, that is uh, unified. Okay, I'm all great. Different. Thank you so much, <laughs> Jennifer. We're about, a, about out of time. Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me on, and I appreciate your beautiful products. For anyone who hasn't seen uh, Katie's work, she does necklaces and earrings and beautiful T-shirts. There's Palestine and freedom and other words written on them, and you can find her on Amazon. Yeah, so, and, and on katiemiranda.com. And on Katie Miranda. So um, you're doing, I, I think you're doing a great job with this. I'm so glad you did this. Thank you, Jennifer.